And so this evening, I thought it might be interesting um, during a recent Wednesday evening discussion, someone, actually David, posed the question of how do we define a Buddhist or who is a Buddhist? And this is not an inconsequential issue, and there are many answers and a few good ones. And we're going to be delving into that issue. But before we begin, let me provide the disclaimer that there are many Buddhisms. And I'm not a, I am addressing this issue in a contextual broad view of Buddhisms. So not all Buddhists would agree with my response. So just as an example, I can speak for Zen Buddhism, I can speak for Tendai Buddhism, I can speak for Pure Land Buddhism, etc. Tibetan Buddhists might have a different view of this. Um, Pali Canon, the, the Theravada Buddhists might have a different view of this. So really, I can speak to a broad notion of what Buddhists would say about it, but some would, some would honestly have, have disagreements, and that's the way Buddhism is. Um, though not all Buddhisms will agree with my responses, I think all Buddhists would recognize the nature of what I'm talking about. And I'm gonna, um, so going along the handout, everybody should have a handout. Did you, did you guys get a handout? Okay. Um, a Buddhist, the definition of a Buddhist in a broad context is someone who adheres to the principles of Buddhism. However, it's not quite so simple when we look at the specifics, such as which principles. So as an example, some Buddhists and scholars dismiss Pure Land Buddhism, which, by the way, is the most, has the greatest number of adherents in the world, Pure Land Buddhists. They dismiss them as Amida worshipers because that school holds, that is the Pure Land schools, there's, there's more than one school of Buddhists of Pure Land, holds that Amitabha Buddha or Amida Buddha is their salvation. They view it quite simply as the idea of meditating, the idea of, the idea of doing many other practices is irrelevant for reasons that I won't go into now because I haven't spent a whole evening on, on that topic. But they view those things as irrelevant, but faith in Amida Buddha or Amitabha Buddha is what one needs to attain salvation, plain and simple, liberation from suffering. They also believe in the formal noble truths, the Eightfold Noble Path, and other fundamental Buddhist values. However, they, the, the orthodoxy within Pure Land says you would never meditate. It's, it's not something you should, one should do. The Amitakar Buddhists, which are numerous in India today, the Amitakar movement started in the 1950s. And by the way, you can find, uh, ne ne not next week, week after I'll be discussing Amitakar Buddhism. But Amitakar Buddhism doesn't adhere to the Four Noble Truths, which would seem to be the most fundamental aspect of Buddhism. There's a principle of Buddhism that they don't follow. And in fact, it depends upon certain Buddhist schools. Some would say, hey, if you don't follow the Four Noble Truths, then how can you consider yourself a Buddhist? Others would say, well, okay, they do other things. They follow the Eightfold Noble Path and the Six Parameters and other things that are essential to, to Buddhism, largely. Um, and they also would say that they have 22 vows that they take. And of those 22 vows, one says that they would not perform Shadra nor give pin, which are pay homage to one's ancestors, Shadra or to make offerings to the ancestors, which is pins. That is an essential part of much of Buddhism throughout Asia, the, that very simple uh, act of uh, paying reference, of uh, paying, venerating one's ancestors and making offerings to them. As a matter of fact, right now in Japan, it's Obon. It's the time that is set aside for the veneration of one's ancestors, and you put offerings out to them every morning. And within this school of Buddhism, Tendai, in September, we will do a 
uh, esoteric ceremony that addresses one's ancestors. However, so I'm just providing some definitions here. The earliest shasana, which is the term that Buddhists use to refer to their own religion in Asia, uh, at the time of Shakyamuni Buddha, there was a fairly well-defined notion of who was a Buddhist, and it was delineated into the four assemblies, bhikshus, males, and bhikshunis, females, who were renunciant mendicants. These were people at the time of Shakyamuni Buddha, these were the folks who were his disciples, men and women who took vows, re -re renunciants by definition, mendicants. They went from place to place. They depended upon the handouts from other people for their livelihood, so to speak, of both food and for, for lodging in most cases. Um, and then there were the, and, and they followed the Vinaya. The Vinaya is the other discipline, approximately 250 rules for men and approximately 320 rules for women. But I have varied from culture to culture uh, over different periods of time. And then there are the Upshaka, the males, and the Upsika, the females, who attended Shakyamuni Buddha and his disciples. And those are the ones who provide the food to the ordained, those who have taken the vows. And these, these are people in, if you go to Thailand today, or you go to Cambodia, or you go to um, Sri Lanka, et cetera, you'll still see the monks wandering around, I shouldn't say wandering, following a route in the morning time to collect um, their food, which is their meal that they will have for the day. Uh, in, in South Asian Buddhism, the ordained have uh, a very light breakfast, which consists of basically tea and sometimes a small amount of rice, and then a, a meal which must be consumed before noon. That's the, the pattern of the ordained folks in South Asia. Um, so bhikshu and bhikshuni were, were those who took the formal vows, that is to say the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, which was recited three times. And while the Ipsaka and the Yafsika were lay followers and were not renunciants, they were expected to make, as I said, the offerings to the, to the renunciants. Now, during Shakyamuni Buddha's lifetime, there was no term that encompassed the four assemblies. The term for the renunciants was Pavisha, not Sangha. Together, they might have been referred to as Buddhists, but later in the Pali Canon, the, the, the Sutra that are written specifically for the Shravakayana, the, the Theravada today, um, that's where we run into the term Sangha. That's where we find the term Sangha. And the Sangha are those individuals who get together as a collective um, community of those who follow Buddhism. So the Buddha is not the person, the Buddha is the awakening that resides within everyone. The Dharma is loosely translated as the teachings. And, 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 and here the term Dharma is used in Hinduism also. So we would have to be explicit and say the Buddha Dharma as opposed to the Vedic Dharma or other terms of that nature. And of course, the Sangha then are, are, is the community. One takes refuge in those three things. We'll get, we'll get to that first. And we could talk about the, that early group and what constituted Buddhists all night and next week also. And we still would just touch the top of it, but I'm gonna move on. In the Mahayana, the development of what we refer to as the Mahayana, a major movement in Buddhist life that was a reinterpretation of religious ideals, beliefs, and values around the dawn of the common era, embraced a new way of perceiving Sangha. Hence, a new way of defining who is a Buddhist. And I'm just reading from the handout now. There are still those who are ordained and those who are lay members, but they were taken together as a whole to be a Sangha, not renunciants alone. So this varied. The Mahayana was different from the early Nikaya Buddhists. Um, this was partly due to the emphasis in the Mahayana on the Bodhisattva. Thus, the Mahayana may be referred to as Bodhisattva Yana. I'll describe that in a minute. And Shravakayana, today's Theravada, is dependent upon the Arhat 
who by de definition must be one who follows the Buddhist Vinaya for multiple lifetimes. Now, what I'm saying in that concise statement is the Bodhisattva is one who has attained awakening or one who is seeking awakening, but eschews becoming a Buddha in order to remain within the samsaric world, the world of, that we live in right now, the world we're having this discussion in, in order to assist other sentient beings. In other words, in other words, to work for the benefit of others. So that, that's one of the major criteria. Whereas in the Shravakayana, which is what we were, that's the more correct term for the Theravada today, um, in South Asia, like in, 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 like in uh, Sri Lanka, Thailand, et cetera. The idea of the Arhat was one who had attained awakening, or the Arhat himself was during this lifetime, the Arhat upon his death will attain Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, which is uh, supreme enlightenment, and the self will dissolve so that the person will not be reborn into another cycle of living and dying, et cetera. Yeah, I should say uh, being born and dying, et cetera. Um, and so that was, that was one of the reasons that you find the definition of a Buddhist being very, very different. Now, keep in mind that societies previous to the 19th century in Asia were far, were for the most part highly stratified you had castes and you had well-defined class systems in Asia up until the middle of the 19th century. Um, several points should be made here. The first is that you have several layers of Buddhism. There are those individuals who become monks and nuns as part of the state organs in East and Northern Asia. So Buddhism in Asia was to a very large extent the state religion, whether we're dealing with China, Tibet, <coughs> Japan, et cetera. Um, and, and here, I, I want to be a little bit careful because when I say it's a state religion, the notion of religion is actually a sociological term. And there was no word for religion in the Asian languages until it had been, the concept had been introduced from Western languages like English and French and Spanish, et cetera. So the idea of religion is a sociological concept that we apply, all of us here were born into a society in which religion is one segment of societal uh, institutions, right? In Asia, Buddhism was much more cultural. And so specifically, there are those who became monks and nuns. And even in those, there were really two categories. There were those who were literate and came from the aristocracy, the elites of the society. And they were formal, official monks and nuns. They were supported by the state. In Japan, as an example, each temple or each school was allocated a certain number of positions of monks and nuns, and the state paid their way. As a matter of fact, the state paid their way so well that that monastery or that temple could afford to have more monks and nuns who were not literate, who came from other castes, because Japan was a caste society until the middle of the 19th century. And so if, you, if one was a, a merchant or a craftsperson or um, a peasant, or in, in Japan, one could have been uh, what would be considered in India the untouchables. And those individuals could become monks and nuns, but often their way was taken care of in the monastery by the fact that the official monks and nuns were more than well taken care of. So the monastery could spread around the wealth, so to speak support itself from the patronage, from the elites of the society. And the elites could have been the formal court. It could have been the, in Japan, it could have been, and you find the same system in, in China and other Asian countries, but I'll use Japan as an example. Uh, it could have been that, that they were part of the imperial household, 
It could have been that they were part of the shogunate, which were the military generals, which really ruled the country for much of Japanese history. Or it could have been that they were aristocratic elite that were the courtesans and, and courtiers to the, to the imperial family. And later on, uh, they became wealth, wealthy merchants and people like that. And those are the patrons. And, but you had people who were not, and, and, and like in, in, interestingly enough, like in Europe, you might have a second or third son or daughter who was not going to fulfill the needs of the family by marrying well or leading the household. Lots of those folks became monks and nuns, just like you had priests in, in Europe. You had men and women who became priests and nuns because they were the second, third, or whatever children in aristocratic families. And so you had, but then you had those, like I said before, that were not formal monks or nuns who took their vows, joined the monastery or the temple, and um, function because the, the, the state took care of those institutions. Um, so let me see, I've already talked about some of this, let me, let me see where I am. Um, okay, and so what we have today is in some places, in the world, such as Thailand and Sri Lanka. Buddhist, uh, in Burma is, is another example. Buddhist monks and nuns are actually part of the state um, bureaucracy. They're still part of the state system. You do not find that obviously in East Asia. You do not find it in, in Japan, Korea, or China today. Nor do you find it in Tibet, because as we know, the Dalai Lama who was the spiritual head as well as the administrative head of, of Tibet, um, going back 14 Dalai Lamas, so to speak, um, fled in the late 1950s, and with him led that system in Tibet. A perspective, Buddhism is a universal religion that does not claim to be the sole source of the truth. And that's with the cap T, truth with a capital T. And over its several millennia, it has adapted and cooperated with other faiths tradition. And as everyone knows here, probably knows here that what we see as Buddhist today is re Buddhism is replete with Taoism, Confucianism, Shinto, it's Tibetan with, with Bon, uh, local religions all contribute to what we think of as Buddhism today. I think many people see Buddhism and the teachings, the direct teachings of sutras as being sort of, no, this is, this is what Buddhism is. But if you were to go to Thailand, as an example, where you have the, the Theravadan system there, uh, Thai Buddhism is, is really quite tied in with Thai local religions. Uh, so that a Thai ceremony is gonna look very different than a Japanese ceremony more than a Korean ceremony or Tibetan ceremony because of the inclusion of these other religious faith traditions. Um, as Buddhism was reintroduced outside of Japan in the 19th century, a different issue arose. And much of the area outside of, Japan, of Asia was dominated by Abrahamic traditions. These traditions are by definition exclusivist. That is to say, as we all know, I, I'm sure that we're, everyone here is of an age. You remember when you were a kid, uh, probably, that someone in your family or someone down the block couldn't get married to somebody else unless they converted to Christianity or Judaism or something along those lines. That's because they're exclusivist religions. From that perspective, you can't be Jewish and Muslim at the same time. Well, as I just said, Buddhism doesn't have that particular problem. Is that somebody that wants to get in? Yeah. Um, so our world has been transformed from a more religious orientation to a more secular one. 
And this has given way to the notion of being spiritual, but not religious to a very large extent. I should point out that this point of view arose in the 19th century. I think many people are not aware of this. The idea of being spiritual came out of spiritualism, which actually started in the 1840s. It's a rather recent um, pers you know, perspective. And along with that, there's a greater acceptance of science, which many people see science and religion as the antithesis of each other. And by the way, I don't hold that view, which I'll discuss a little bit later. In this context, Buddhism is perceived as a spiritual practice by those who are disassociated from formal religion. And it's generally acknowledged by anthropologists, sociologists, scholars of religion, and theologians that Buddhism is a formal religion as formal as Roman Catholicism or Islam. While Buddhism is a religion, it still occupies a locus of philosophy, way of life, cultural attributes, worldview, all in one. Thus, we have people whose worldview is initially formed by formal or informal exposure to the Abrahamic traditions, agnosticism, atheism, or other foundational beliefs, but who feel that some characteristics of Buddhism fit their notion of the world and how it functions. That is to say, they believe, and I have uh, set off belief in reincarnation, karma, mindfulness meditation, or some other perceived Buddhist tenet and are comfortable claiming an association with Buddhism. Additionally, many people are attracted to the teachings of Buddhism, especially some of the more popular teachers, such as Thich Nhat Hanh, the Dalai Lama, David Loy, Stephen Batchelor, et cetera. And thus they feel an affinity. And that's, that's understandable. Such people, by the way, we often refer to as bedstand Buddhists. As what? Bedstand Buddhists. In other words, they keep a book by Thich Nhat Hanh on their bedstand, and they read it before they go to bed. And if you ask them, are you a religion, they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I follow Thich Nhat Hanh because that's what they've been reading. You know? um, and, and by the way, that the term bedstand Buddhist, believe it or not, is the formal term used in academia as well as used in popular press. Um, but I, 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 like the, I like the term. Um, that is to say that, that those who are bedstand Buddhists generally pick and choose between elements of many faith traditions, choosing those that appeal to them and rejecting aspects that they disagree with. They seldom actually belong to a Sangha, participate in observances, or support Buddhist teachings directly. And that, that's one of the distinctions I would make in this. So the question is, does that make them Buddhists? Because they happened to follow Thich Nhat Hanh or the Dalai Lama, David Lloyd. What does it mean to adhere to the principles of Buddhism? Do they follow such essential teachings as the six pyramids and six perfections? Do they acknowledge the primacy of Buddhist teachings in their life? Meaning, does, do the Buddhist teachings become a way of conducting one's life as opposed to it's something that one does periodically? Um, do they belong to a Sangha? In other words, one of the basic tenets of Buddhism is the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. Is it possible to be a Buddhist and not belong to a Sangha? That becomes a real question. And I'm trying to skip through here some. No that I did not say meditate. Meditation does not, in, there are meditations which are Christian, meditations which are Muslim, meditations which are Jewish. Meditation is not unique to Buddhism. So because one meditates does not, in fact, make one Buddhist, just to, just to, to put that out there. The vast majority, as I said before, the vast majority of Buddhists in the world do not meditate. Specific, the specific Buddhist definition, one who takes refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Taking refuge in the three te treasures is, the most, is most relevant outside of Asia. Since as explained earlier, in Asia, one is born Buddhist. You're born in Japan, the view is that you're born Buddhist, unless you choose to 
say I'm Christian or I'm Muslim or some other faith tradition, it's assumed that you're Buddhist and Shinto. So in, in Japan, it's interesting, UNESCO lists uh, the percentage of religion. I, I keep not looking over this way, I apologize. Um, UNESCO lists uh, Japan, the last time I looked, which was a few years ago, the last time I looked, it said 85% of the Japanese population is uh, Buddhist, 95% is Shinto, and the remainders uh, say I'm not, I have no religion. On the other hand, if you ask a Japanese person and they say I have no religion, if you ask them, well, who buried your grandfather? You ask, is your grandfather alive? No. Who buried your grandfather? Oh, my family is Soto Zen, or my family is Pure Land Buddhist. That'll be the response because they see it in a cultural context, not in a religious context. But the point is, you're born Buddhist. You don't have to do something necessarily. Um, and, and, and I could go into how the Danka system, the system that was set up during the Tokugawa period uh, from the 1600s until the middle of the 19th century, really required all, all citizens in Japan to belong to a particular temple, usually the temple that was closest. And the temple also, as, as the church was in Europe, was also a place that kept the civil records, who was married, who died, who was born, and all that sort of thing. That was part of the Danka system. Um, now, refuge in, in, the, in the West, we, we see that many people take refuge formally and we have a ceremony here at Tendai Buddhist Institute. I'll just be in there. We have a ceremony here at Tendai Buddhist Institute to give people refuge who choose to do it. One doesn't have to attend. One doesn't have to take refuge to attend. It's never said that you must take refuge to be a member or anything like that. Because that's a personal issue. That's up to the individual. And also, an individual can take a personal refuge. You can take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma Sangha within yourself. You can say, I'm going to adhere to those that call the three treasures. I'm going to adhere to the three treasures without doing it formally and still be a Buddhist. Um, however, if one does it in that way, then in a sense, one is more obligated to be especially rigorous with one's study and practice. Okay, finally, and I'm going to finish up here. How do I, Monchi, define a Buddhist? Quite simply, if one says I'm a Buddhist, I take it at face value. I have no criteria by which I say you're only a Buddhist if you do the following, the following criteria. On the other hand, um, if they don't follow the Buddhist teachings, and I'm, I'm never going to ask someone this, but if they don't follow the Buddhist teachings, then they're deluding themselves into whether or not they're Buddhist. I'm not in a position to evaluate that. I can't, I'm not gonna say, hey, Dan, you claim to be a Buddhist. Have you done the following six things this week? You know, that would be pretty presumptuous of me as, as well as arrogant, so I would never do that. So very, very clearly from my perspective, if one says they're a Buddhist, I just take it at face value. I don't question. Um, for any number of reasons. Okay, why don't we ask some questions? I'll ask the people in the room who, uh, uh, Dan and, I'm sorry, I forget your names. Rain and Martin. Rain and Martin. You're going to go out to the hondo in just a minute, and Susan's going to take you out there and give you some instruction so you don't feel awkward when we're doing the service, okay? So do, any, do the three of you have any questions first before we let you go? Dan? Mark? Rain? No, okay. Why don't you go on out with Susan? That's the woman who's walking out as we speak. <laughs> and we'll be, we'll, someone will be out in a few minutes. Other people will be out in a few minutes. Um, okay, David, you had your hand up first. I think we have to accept that one could be a Buddhist without being a member of a Sangha. For two reasons. One, we have people who become isolated deliberately as hermits, use the Western term, and can go for years with virtually no 
human continent. And we can't say they that they're virtually here. No human, human contact. Human contact. But we can't say they're not Buddhists because they're actually doing this to study Buddhism. Okay. Secondly, okay. just to go on, you have people who wander. And this was particularly a case in the time of the Silk Road, where people will be wandering quite often with nobody else of their own religion for months at a time. And you can't say that if they're always away from a Sangha, they're never in one place to settle down, that they're not a Buddhist. Okay, in both cases, the individuals, the hermits, called forest monks in South Asia. Forest monks in Thailand, forest monks, exactly. They still belong to a Sangha. They still have a, an affiliation with a group. And that group actually assists them by providing them food. Mm -hmm. Bringing them food, that's, their, that's part of their sangha. If they didn't belong to, if they didn't have that affiliation, you would not have the lay people bringing them the food. But so she lived under a bridge making vinegar. Was he a member of the sangha? He was. And if he, and they're, so because one is hermit, we'll use the term, because one is a hermit does not necessarily mean that one does not belong to the sangha. It means that they don't get together on a regular basis with other people, but they still belong to the Sangha. When you look at the people who are on the Silk Road, they all came out of a monastic setting and they traveled as- to the point about the merchants. Uh, yeah, right, right. Well, some of those merchants may have been lay. And, mm -hmm. and remember in Asia, the Sangha doesn't necessarily assemble once a week. The ordained assemble theoretically in an orthodox sense, they assemble on every full moon and, and um, new moon, so every fortnight, in order to recite the Vinaya and to make a confession if they haven't followed the, the rules, so to speak. Okay. But nonetheless, they would still be, they would still have a teacher. They would still have, if they were on the Silk Road or merchants, whoever, they would still have a teacher, maybe more than one teacher, teachers, and they would belong to and um, sort, sort of a more mobile sangha. They wouldn't have a sangha that was just in one location like you have here. But that, that would still be a sangha. So, okay. and, and remember, as mendicants, Buddhist disciples were wandering all the time. Right. They were going from town to town, village to village. And, but they would get the, together, they constituted a sangha because periodically they would gather together under a grove and either hear teachings or do ceremonies, that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, and then I'm gonna take Shoshi and I'll look on screen to see if there's somebody else. Yes, but Shoshi. what about people who live in places, remote parts of, I mean, the East and West Coast, we don't have right. a problem, but what about the people who live in the nowhere? Yeah. They don't have a sound Well, actually it's I'm looking at people on the screen who are living in places that are don't have a temple near them, but they have this sound they're still considered part of this sangha. That's a model. Yeah. No, not, not really. There are people who are members of Tendai Buddhist Institute who live in New York City, who live in Chicago, and still are members here. They will still be in contact with me. They make donations, et cetera, et cetera. And, and for instance, there's one person who is a member of uh, Seishin Sangha in the Adirondacks, he lives in Chicago. <clears throat> but he's still a member of, of Seishin Sangha. But there are places where it's just not available. You know, right. people don't have uh, the wife or well, you know, whatever. I understand, but, you, but you're also looking at it within a Western context of you have to belong to the local parish. And in Buddhism, that's not always the situation. Um, and so, and, and I agree, you might live in the middle of Montana someplace and there's nobody around who's also Buddhist. Um, if you're Jewish, there also probably aren't a lot of Jewish folks around, you can't do minions. So if you have to do Kaddish, you're in tough luck, you know. On the other hand, um, from a Buddhist perspective, that's unfortunate, but typically, like a lot of the people that I see on, online here, they will have reached out and are joining a group somewhere. 
And I know many, many other temples who have a similar, similar structure. A couple of questions. Okay, let's take some questions on screen. I, I think um, Sam, you have your Sam. I'll take Sam, and then I'll take Glenn. Yeah, I was curious. Lay people in Japan yeah. are Buddhist by birth, according by to birth. right. And do they ever take refuge? Sometimes. Pardon? Sometimes. Okay. I know that I know that several years ago it was an anniversary. Maybe Ichishima Sensei would like to, to respond to this since he's in Japan and a priest right now. Uh, several years ago, it was an anniversary on uh, something to do with Enrakuji, and there was a drive to have people take refuge, and there were hundreds of people who took refuge at that time. So the answer is, and, and in Japan, you have both Danka members, and Danka members are members of a temple. Right. They, they pay a, a, a sum of money to the temple to be members. And then you have Shinja, and Shinja are people who are more devout, and they will attend pilgrimages and attend ceremonies and rituals and, and that yeah, sort of thing. I'm, I'm familiar with that. But what about just your basic layperson? Do they do any uh, Buddhist practices? It depends. Some do, some don't. I see. It, it's like let's 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 contrast it to a um, a person who's Jewish. Some go to temples, some don't. You know, some some will some have a mezuzah on their on their house. But, yeah, I'm well aware of that. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's it's not it's not so different. That's all I'm saying. Uh, Ichishima Sensei, would you like to address part of, of um, Mushin's question about lay folks in Japan? Ichishima Sensei, you're, you're muted. <laughs> well, uh, in our congregations, they come to temple, uh, especially uh, Obon, uh, Urabon season and uh, uh, other ohigan etc they come to their tomb uh, to pay homage at that time they drop by the temple etc just naturally um, but that is their daily life okay thank you thank you sensei oh they uh, observe rituals yeah okay. um cultural rituals i gotta see who's I can't see people's names on there, so hold on. But Chip, you had your hand up. You're also uh, in yes. the... Yes, I was uh, curious to ask each uh, Shima Sensei, um, like in America, after World War II, um, the religious uh, whole uh, of people started to relax, and so that they're People my age who are not no longer uh, practicing Christians and, and don't belong to a church, or and many of the institutions uh, like ca uh, Catholic cathedrals and so forth uh, are are not able to sustain themselves. They have to sell them. It, it and and what's happening with in Japan with the youth? Are they still? Uh, supporting the church, or are they living in the cities by themselves and, and, and don't don't uh, practice a, mm. anything. What what what's happening in Japan with the with the current youth? Well, generally they they do not uh, practice uh, special things, but you know they customarily come to temple to pay homage to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And nothing particular. That this is a kind of a custom uh, to visit their temple and yes, their tombs. Yes. Let, let me just let me just clarify a little bit what Ichishima Sensei was saying. And I think that you have to recognize that in Asia, there's a different pattern of observance than there is in the Abrahamic traditions. In the Abrahamic traditions, you have in Judaism the Sabbath, where one is supposed to attend temple synagogue on Friday night, Saturday, 
Uh, if you're Muslim, you're supposed to go to the uh, mosque uh, daily if you're Orthodox, five times a day or at least on a Friday. And if you're Christian, you got to remember that, that at one time in the Americas, everything was closed on Sunday. So you had no choice but to go to church and to, to do those things. But in the, as you pointed out, Chip, in the 20th century, that's been dropping off radically. But there's always been a different pattern between what we think of as Buddhist observance in Asia contrasted to observance in the Abrahamic tradition, because there's no day of the week that one is expected to go to the temple uh, in Japan or in China, or you go during special occasions. And if you tend to be more devout, then you'll attend classes with the, with the priest or the, the uh, Soryo, or you will um, join together in pilgrimages, things along those lines. So there's a different level. There's a different level of expected observance uh, in the West contrasted to Asia. That's always been the case, and and that really has nothing to do with 20th century or 15th century. That's just the way that the pattern has always been. Okay, just well, yeah. Why don't why don't we why don't we move along? And I'll, I'll just make one one other one other point because the the folks here are going to have to go out to the out to the uh, temple. I think the other thing to recognize is that in Asia, that people have a butsudan in the house, in their home. A butsudan is a Buddhist, their own personal Buddhist altar that they will have in the home, as well as, as a kamidan, which is the altar for the spirits, the Shinto spirits. And so it's very common for people to be at the butsudan and in the morning to make an offering, to ring the bell, to light the incense, to open it up and to do those things. And I, I, there's a, a kind of magic if you're in the, uh, the really inner city part of Tokyo or Ko Kyoto, places like that, where it's almost more like alleyways, you will find it, it's really interesting. If you're there early in the morning and you're walking down the street, you'll hear people ringing the bell and the smell of incense from this house to that house is going to be different as people uh, are at the Butsudan of making that observance in the morning. You know, how many people in the West really do that sort of thing? That's, that's a form of observance that we typically do not do. And so I think that that's a way of making a distinction that in Buddhism, in let's say Japan, the observance on a daily basis is at the Butsudan in the house Whereas in the Abrahamic, in the West, in the Abrahamic traditions, people are expected to go to church or mosque or synagogue on a weekly basis. I'm going to leave that there and let the people here go out to the Thank hondo. You. Thank, you, Thank you, everyone. Has everyone seen the images from the Webb Space Telescope? If you haven't, they are easily accessible by doing a search online. Hint, use DuckDuckGo rather than Google. <laughs> the images are mind-boggling. On the NASA website, there's a description of yesterday's release, and I'll quote this. Quote, today we present humanity with a groundbreaking new view of the cosmos from the James Webb Space Telescope, a view the world has never seen before, said NASA Administrator Bill Nelson. These images, including the deepest infrared view of our universe that has ever been taken, show us how Webb will help to uncover the answers to questions we don't even yet know to ask. Questions that will help us better understand our universe and humanity's place within it, unquote. I'm not a space geek, by the way. I'm just impressed by the beauty of the images and the scientific discoveries that will unfold beyond my lifetime. This instrument is 100 times more powerful than its predecessor, the Hubble. And astrophysicists and astronomers tell us that it will completely change our scientific understanding of the universe. Think about that. This one technological device will change radically how we view the universe. I say scientific understanding because as a Buddhist and as a scientist, albeit a biological scientist, 
I have two understandings. There are understandings that come from the Buddhist canon and understandings that come through science, which is observational, experiential, and experimental. Those two understandings are not mutually exclusive. I mentioned earlier in the presentation that we often think of science and religion as being antithetic to one another. The Buddhist literature, Buddhist literature posits that there is a consciousness that is present in the universe that pervades all objects in the universe. This is implied in the assumption that sentiency exists in rocks, water, mountains, clouds, etc. That sentiency resides in our individual cells, not only as an artifact of our central nervous system. And it's really interesting that recently experiments with octopus have realized that their central nervous system is not central, that each of their limbs has a separate brain, and that they can de de detect the consciousness and sentiency within the cells of the octopus. There are legitimate scientists, especially those who study consciousness, who are inclined to this very idea. That is to say, the consciousness is in the universe, and our individual consciousness is just part of that stream of flow. And by the way, I'm going to give a plug here. If, never, if people have never seen uh, Fantastic Fungi, which is available, again, Fantastic Fungi, do a search, watch that film. The last one third has to do with hallucinogens and mushrooms. You can turn it off when it gets there. But the first two thirds are really fascinating, especially in relation to what I'm talking about right now. The problem that scientists have when we study consciousness is how do we find a way to prove it? How do we test a hypothesis? What instrumentation do we use? Issues that are like that. As we look at the image from the Webb telescope, <clears throat> we should remember that just days ago, we did not have the technology to investigate questions we didn't even know we had until yesterday. Will science once again catch up with the Buddhist canon? Is there a consciousness in the universe that sages two millennia ago were able to plug into that we're just beginning to realize now? There are a host of, question, a host of questions that arise in my mind as I peer into the past billions of years ago, though the seeming magic, through the seeming magic of the Webb Space Telescope, that is ultimately what I find so exciting about it. That is also why having faith in Buddhist teachings and believing in what science tells me are not conflicting paradigms. Svaha. Uh -huh. And I just want to point out to you that this image that you see here is from that telescope. And that brown mass that you see in front of you is actually galaxies forming out of space dust. That's amazing to think about looking at that that existed billions and billions of years ago because it's so far away that we're just catching up to the light from it. And the quote today is from Werner Heisenberg. Not only is the universe stranger than we think, it is stranger than we can think.